I want to start with the photo. And whoever kind of wants to lead off, that's totally fine. Um, literally, you know, what it is, what's happening, but then what it's come to mean to you all in this work that you're doing. Yeah, I noticed in March this past year, some, one of my former students sent me uh, somebody's in Instagram post where they posted the photograph. And I've noticed this phenomenon the last 10 years. It had 2.3 million views in two days. But nobody seems to know the backstory. The backstory is I did an oral history project in high school with my students. We interviewed World War II veterans and shortly before 9-11, the summer of 2001, I interviewed a tank commander who fought across Europe for 10 months and he told me all kinds of wonderful, you know, things that he and his friend, the experience they had weren't wonderful in the war, but they came out of the war with a, a warm friendship. And he told me at the end of the interview, his daughter actually chimed in and said, tell him about that train. He never told me the story. I was about to turn the oral history uh, interview off and terminate it, turn the camera off. And um, he started to tell me about how they came upon a train. And the photograph that you see was taken by his major. His major was Clarence Benjamin, the 743rd Tank Battalion. Um, and the, the tank commander said he ordered his tank and his friend's tank out to investigate what was happening with this um, train. And as they arrived at the liberation site, what would become the liberation site, the people streamed up the hill towards the major. He stood up in the Jeep and he snapped that photograph for his after action report. And later the details came out. So it got filed away like wartime photos do. And um, my interview um, with the tank commander, his name was Red Walsh. He, he uh, alluded to the photograph and sent me to his friend, George Gross, the other tank commander who lived in California who had a copy of that photograph and 11 others that he took that day of the liberation, which, which uh, he gave me permission to put on our school website. So that was the first time it had seen the light of day since April 13, 1945. And now it's sort of become this iconic photo uh, of the Holocaust. Yeah, yeah, it really has. It's, it's one of those things when you, when you think about photographs of trains and associate them with the Holocaust, you don't think about people being liberated. You think the exact opposite, people going to their deaths in the cattle cars, et cetera. This is completely the opposite. And when um, I had the chance to show them to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, their museum staff was blown away by the fact that these photographs existed. Mike, is there anything that you want to share in what this photo has come to, to mean to you in this work? Um, I never knew the photo existed until I visited a veteran um, and I mean the photo represents you know a lot of people know the story of Schindler's List right um, this liberation is two and a half times Schindler's List in a single moment um, it's it's amazing and I think like what Matt said it's a story of caring you know uh, that veteran that I interviewed uh, one of the very first things he said to me in the interview was we weren't trained to be humanitarians we were trained to be soldiers but when they encountered this they stopped and they helped um, and you know we did the math I think a couple of months ago there's 40 50,000 people alive today because of what those guys did and it grows daily you know so it's truly it's truly an amazing story and how it all came to be and how Matt discovered it it's just it's it's just an amazing amazing story and as the years goes by there are less survivors that are still alive there are less soldiers that are still with us to share these stories on their own is that why this is so important to you and getting this story out there I think to me <clears throat> um, you know, we've been working on this project for a long time. Matt, obviously, a lot longer. Um, you know, people have asked me, Mike, you're not Jewish. Why are you doing this? You know, why are you and Matt doing this? You know, it's not just me, it's Matt, too, and a lot of other people, 
that are working on this? And, you know, my answer is because I'm a dad. I got kids. And I have to be able to look them in the eye and know that I tried to do something to show them how to be human, how to care, you know. Um, and so that's, that's what I've tried to do. And that's my motivation is to educate, to inspire, to create a new generation of liberators, right? Because we're all going to face in life these moments. Are, are we going to stop and care? Are we going to help somebody? that needs our help or are we just going to ignore it and move on and hopefully we can inspire the world with this story and obviously what Matt has done so that's that's been the driving force behind it for me so it's a story of miracles the fact that these soldiers came upon this train just as the German SS was setting up machine guns and ordering the men and the boys out of this train <laughs> When they heard the tanks in the background, they took off. And they were captured later. The guards threw down their rifles, ran away, started taking off the uniforms. The engineer of the train who was driving the uh, engine, he split. He got out of town because the Americans showed up. And it was Friday the 13th, 1945, a beautiful spring morning when these soldiers encountered this tableau of humanity that was suffering, that needed help, they were on their way to fight a major battle. The city of Magdeburg wouldn't surrender on the Elbe River. The Russians were coming in the other side. So these tankers and the 30th Infantry Division, they had a job to do and it wasn't to uh, take care of people. It wasn't a humanitarian mission, but they did. They stopped. They got the people out of harm's way. They got the medical attention. They forced the German townspeople to open their doors. Um, German doctors and nurses had to help take care of these people as the American medics arrived. And uh, the soldiers went on their way. And that's why when I interviewed Red Walsh, it was almost like an afterthought to him. He was only there for one hour. Mm. But the man who took the photographs, George Gross, his tank was stationed overnight with the train until uh, American Relief could arrive the next day. Um, so he wrote a beautiful narrative. He gave me the photographs. He said, put them on your school website, which I did in March 2002. They sat there for four years, um, this oral history project that I had on the internet with my kids, my students. And uh, I heard from a grandmother in Australia exactly four years later in March 2006 who said she saw the photographs of the day of her liberation. She was a seven-year-old Dutch girl, and she fell out of her chair. She started to cry. She got George Gross's information from, from uh, my website. She called him up, and uh, they had a beautiful conversation. And that's how, when I say it's a story of miracles, it's a miracle that the American soldiers arrived on time, saved these people. Um, it's a miracle that Lexi Keston, the grandmother in Australia, got a little bit of closure by talking to her actual American soldier liberator. And what happened after that was children, there were probably 500 kids on that train. They began to contact me. So we set up a reunion at the high school in front of uh, a student audience of 1,500 kids. The liberator, Red Walsh, the man I originally interviewed, who was 80 at the time of the interview, and uh, three boys who were on the train. A doctor from London flew over, a uh, physicist at Brooklyn College came up, and an airline executive in New Jersey, all kids on the train, one from Hungary, one from Poland, one from German, Germany originally. Um, they came up and met their liberator in front of a student audience. And one of the things that uh, is really important to, to recall is what Red Walsh, the liberator, said. He said, look, <laughs> I was just there. I was doing what humanity should have been doing. I'm not your hero. I'm not your liberator. I did what human beings should be doing. This should have never happened to begin with. How could this have happened? That was his line. And he gave our students and he gave the world a message that we have to take care of people. And it's so, I'm so thankful that 
The story has now come to light. We've heard from over 300 child survivors. Mike and I just got back from Israel. Mike's been filming interviews with liberators and survivors for the past six or eight years. So we, we got a chance to talk to a dozen or so um, Holocaust survivors and their families who are on the train. So we have second generation, we have third generation, as Michael alluded to, thousands, tens of thousands of people who just wouldn't be alive if it hadn't been for that moment when the American soldiers stopped and cared. So that's our message to, to the world. And, you know, when we talk about this experience of almost 80 years later now, we're talking to those children these people are still alive. This thing called the Holocaust happened in their lifetime. 2,500 people were saved on April 13, 1945. Many of the older people, grandparents of the people that we talked to, died in the days after liberation, but they died with the word freedom on their lips. And, uh, you know, the other point that's really important to make on this Holocaust memorial commemoration time of the year is it's not a happy ending story. I mean, it is, <laughs> but it's not. Because for every one of the 2,500 people on the train who were murdered, excuse me, who were, who were um, for every one of the 2,500 people liberated on that day, there was another 2,500 people who were murdered in the four and a half years of the Holocaust in Europe. And we have to keep that in mind because you know, you say never again, but what does that really mean? People don't know the story. People don't know the story of the Holocaust. We need to educate people, and that's the whole point of what Michael and I are trying to do with this, this project. You mentioned a lot of the connections that you have made through this work and the connections that you've seen different people make, um, and reunions if you want to call them. On a personal level for you as an educator, as a historian, what has that been like? Well, the last interview we did in Jerusalem, just Sunday, <laughs> we interviewed two people who were, who were very young children, and Miriam grabbed my hand at the end, and she just kept saying over and over again, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. Now, she did get to meet one of her liberators in 2011, when Frank Towers, who Michael also talked to, who will be in our film, got to travel over to Israel, <laughs> I was there too, and met uh, 55 of the children who were on the train and hundreds and hundreds of second and third generation people. She said, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. And she, you know, she talked about God. And she told me I was a messenger from God, which broke me up, and I've heard it before. But when you think about what this, you know, simple classroom project, an oral history project, tell me what you did in World War II, what it led to was a, a measure of healing in the world that just keeps going forward. And it really showed that the past is not dead. We tripped the warriors of the cosmos. We showed the power of love and what it meant when these soldiers took care of these young Holocaust survivors and the fact that they got to meet these actual people that they saved to 65, 70, 80 years later. You, it just, it leaves you speechless. It really does because you see God working through these liberators. And this is what the survivors are telling us. It's not <laughs> me trying to put myself on a pedestal, but it's, it just never stops happening as far as um, getting, meeting these people in the second and third generation. This trip that we just got back from Israel was very emotional. And we're, I'm still processing it. I'm sure Michael is. Mm -hmm. going into these people's homes mm -hmm. and you're talking about the most traumatic things that happen to them in their entire lives and the fact that you know with tears in their eyes they're thanking us for allowing 
this never to be forgotten, moving the story forward, and just keeping it in the forefront of people's lives. And like Miriam said, it's, it's a miracle on many, many, many levels. And that's kind of hard for the human brain to process because we literally strip back. I keep saying we, we, we trip the words of the cosmos. The power of love has triumphed over evil and it just keeps manifesting itself in the actions of those soldiers on April 13, 1945. These guys got to see, I don't want to call it the fruits of their labors because they suffered trauma too when they ran into these people, but they got to see what their actions actually did, actually meant. And it's a very powerful lesson for young people and adults all over the world to really see, geez, what you do matters, remembering these things and teaching the Holocaust, these, these things just have to keep going forward and that's what our film is all about. And I think you referred to it as a simple classroom project leading to all this. Uh, Mike, did you ever think something like that would, would lead to this or either of you? No, no. I mean, I, I heard about the story from my cousin. My cousin wrote a book, uh, co-authored a book on the 30th Infantry Division, which is the division that did the liberating, you know. And I honestly didn't know much about the story when I began. Matt's book hadn't been published yet. And I went down to interview Frank Towers, one of the liberators, and he told me this story. I sat in his dining room, you know, for almost four hours and listened to this story, and my mouth was on the floor. Um, you know, we had just finished another film that had been uh, on PBS. And I was honestly tired. I wasn't really looking for another project. Um, but this story grabbed my heart. And uh, Frank was gracious, had us down to his home. Um, and then he said at the end of the interview, after we turned off the camera, he said, well, the person that you really need to talk to is Matt Roselle. And I knew a little bit about Matt at the time, but I said, how does he play into this story? And Frank said, well, I'll let Matt explain that to you. And so I called Matt and didn't hear from him for a few weeks. And then he finally called me back. And, you know, we just started to work together on it. So, yeah, here we are. We're not done yet, but, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're making great strides, so. And uh, Matt touched on some of what he hopes, you know, why you're doing this, what people take away from it. Mm -hmm. What are your hopes? I think it goes back to what I said earlier. What I hope people take away from this is that a single action of caring can have huge impact. You know, and also the question, what do you want the world to be, right? How do you want to, what world do you want to live in, you know? And um, these soldiers demonstrated, you know, that a caring world and a caring place can have huge impact on people's lives. And, and you know, how can we inspire a new generation of liberators? You know, that's why we're doing it. That's the whole reason why we're doing the project is to educate and inspire. So. That's, that's my message. And the cliche goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. But how does that relate for this picture for the both of you? It shows the moment of liberation. You see the joy on the woman's face. She's holding the hand of a little girl who looks terrified, who could be her daughter, probably is. And if you look at the little girl's expression and compare it with the mother's, the mother is just overcome with joy. And the little girl, she looks pretty terrified. And uh, I, I'm almost sure it's because these two, these two Sherman tanks with the white star are rolling up rather loudly right behind this Jeep that has just pulled up. The major stands up, takes the photograph, his driver's driving. And uh, these monsters are coming towards her she doesn't know what it is and some of the people we interviewed on the uh, you know they kind of elaborated they were kids too they said it was like these these creatures emerging from the ground one woman said she talked about mm -hmm. the people coming up the hill and just wrapping her arms around the tank treads and then the turret hatch opens up the American commander gets out and uh, these people are just crying, they're overjoyed. But if you look in the background of the photograph, you can see 
a lot of people are struggling to get up the hill. There's one guy in the background who's just sitting on the edge of the, the car in one of the photographs, because again, there were like 11 photographs. He's too weak to even get out of the cattle car. Um, so the next morning, the Americans sprang into action. And as Frank Towers said, <laughs> We weren't trained to be humanitarians. This wasn't a rescue mission. Our mission was to take the city of Magdeburg and end the war. And a lot of these guys died over the next two days fighting that final battle. So here we are almost 80 years later, and uh, it just seems that it's come full circle. The children have had the opportunity to meet the actual soldiers who liberated them. Unfortunately, the soldiers that we know of, we did get to interview, they're gone now. But, you know, we had the opportunity to show, have them see what <laughs> they did. And it meant a lot to these American soldiers because, again, they're 18, 19, 20 years old. They're coming from all over America. They don't know anything about this thing called the Holocaust. And here it is, thrust in their face. So it was traumatic for them too. And at the end of the day, to see the expressions on their faces when they got to meet these children in the second and third generation, the, the fruits of what they did on that day was just really amazing. One of our contacts at the Holocaust Museum, who's become a good friend, she said that photograph is unique in all of the Holocaust. There's no other photograph like it. Why? Because it shows a moment of liberation. Um, there's no other photograph like it in all the Holocaust. Um, it's one of the most powerful photographs considered of the 20th century. And it was hidden in a shoebox of a soldier's closet for 65 years. But because Matt decided to teach, it came to light. And now, with the project, it's going to touch hundreds of millions of people around the world when we're done. So, um, you know, you ask me what the photograph means to me. It's just, the photograph is just a story of just amazing caring, and hopefully that'll inspire people around the world. I think what's really striking with which both of you have touched on today is when you see the photograph and then think of how many lives there are living today and how many lives affected by that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's the actual moment. It's like the freeze frame. It's like the uh, cell phone picture that somebody got. There's other liberation photos that are relatively iconic from the Holocaust, but again, as Mike stated, our friend at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, trains and the Holocaust and photographs, you don't see too many liberation photographs, and the fact that this is the actual, actual second that they realize that they're being liberated, the expressions on their faces, um, it's just, if, if people haven't seen it yet, <laughs> Now they're going to know the rest of the story, and they're going to learn about the soldiers, and they're going to learn about the survivors of the Holocaust, and what this thing called the Holocaust, almost unimaginable f catastrophe, um, because it was just so, so massive. Um, they need, people need to know, because it was, <clears throat> again, within people's lifetime, the people that we interviewed last week, <laughs> they lived it. It can happen again. It was an unthinkable thing, but the unthinkable became real in the most, one of the most educated, cultured countries in Europe. Educated people were <laughs> the drivers of this engine called the Holocaust. So there's a lot of lessons here, and people should really pay attention. Sarah, is there anything? labor the point, and I know Eric asked about it, but does there feel to be more of a sense of urgency to tell this story in recent years, especially as anti-Semitism is on the rise in the United States? I mean, I saw a study last month that it's um, almost a 23% rise in anti-Semitism just this year. Oh, yeah. I mean, in, in the case study that we have for the project, I mean, that's all of that data is in there. You know, so you're seeing the rise of anti-Semitism, you're seeing the rise of hate, you know, and that fuels us to want to do it even more, you know, because people don't know their history, right? And so we need to combat that. We need to stop that. 
Um, and that is absolutely a huge motivating factor for us. I mean, just the statistics that I saw the other day, I was, re I, it was I was shocking, you know. But yes, that's absolutely one of the reasons why we're doing the project. There's so much ignorance and fear in the world. We talk about never forget. Well, the thing to remember, unfortunately, is we move away from this generation that lived through it. People... They can't remember it if they never learned it in the first place. And that's what we need to keep in the forefront is, and that's the whole point of my book and the whole point of Michael's project, the film, it's to educate people and not just young people. It's uh, all kinds of people. Our American soldiers, the liberators, really didn't understand their whole place and the magnitude of this catastrophe known as the Holocaust. Okay, World War II was the most cataclysmic event in the history of the world. The Holocaust took place during this time period. It could easily happen again. And that's, that's the thing that people, they don't think about as they go on living their daily, everyday lives. Um, and the cliche is, well, if you don't learn from the past, you're destined to repeat it. And that, that's true. But you have to learn it to begin with. So as an educator, um, What other story is, is as important as this lesson that comes out of six million European Jews being murdered in this four and a half year time span? How do you kill four and a half million people in that time span? Excuse me, six million people in four and a half years. Can you imagine that? How do you do it? Well, we know that the Germans had their death camps but that, they didn't wake up one day and say, oh, let's build a death camp. They, it was a process, and it was a process that took place. I don't want to say they were making it up as they went along, but there was an underlying ideology that this group of people was going to be targeted. They were going to be hunted down just based on their, um, their religion, and the Nazis made it a racial thing. So... If it happened then, in the most cultivated country in Europe, how could it, it could happen anywhere, really. So this is, you know, rising anti-Semitism. I've been teaching this for 20, 30 years now. Um, it's discouraging to see, but I really feel, you know, and this whole thing comes back to the message of hope as well. I really think that if people learn the story, and we've personalized the story on many, many levels, that the takeaway is going to be, well, we can learn from the past, and we can move forward. People need to speak up. What you do as an individual matters, because there was an individual soldier who pulled the trigger. and shot a woman and her baby and watched them fall into a ditch. That was, it happened. It can happen again. And then I guess just my last question, I know we talked uh, about it I think a little bit before the interview. This has been, I mean, a decade in the making for you and eight years in the making for you. What's left on the documentary? If you can kind of, I guess, um, put that into perspective for us. So we have filming yet to do. We're trying to focus right now on raising the remaining amount of money that we need to finish the project. Uh, it's about $600,000 that we need. Um, the project is threefold. Uh, it's a mini-series. Uh, it's an educational curriculum. So we're making an educational curriculum. And then we're trying to do a screening tour of the film. So it's a three-part process. Um, but right now we're focused on getting the remaining interviews that we need and finish, finishing raising the amount of money that we need to make it. So if I had a magic you know, wand, um, you know, I'd like to finish the project this year, if we can, uh, and then try to release it sometime next year. And it'll be distributed by ITV Studios out of London, which is one of the largest television distributors in the world. So, and that's a, whole, that's a whole miracle story behind that as well, how we got in touch with them. So, 
And if people want to learn more about our project, they can go to our website, MagdaBergTrain.com, in which we explain, you know, what we're trying to do with the film. You can see some of the trailers that Michael has done, and uh, I guarantee you, anybody who goes there and watches the trailer will be really inspired to learn more about this story and, and learn more about the Holocaust. And if they go to the website, they can also help contribute to the project if they're so moved. I was going to ask about that last stuff that you all just talked about, so that covered that. Um, I am curious, do you have the exact numbers of um, survivors from the, the um, train and liberators that you've talked to for this project in total? Well, we're going back um, a long time. Yeah. Um, we, the liberator Frank Towers, who learned of my project, Shortly after the very first reunion I was telling you about with the three survivors and Red Walsh, I got an email from him because the Associated Press did an article. That was in 2007. And um, I heard from 60 survivors before the week when it was out. It went all over the world. I heard from Frank Towers who said, hey, <laughs> I was the guy who transported these people on Saturday morning to this abandoned or this, this uh, recently taken German Luftwaffe military base that had hospitals and doctors to help these people. So Frank came into the picture, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, asked me to apply for their museum teacher fellowship program. Uh, so I made some connections down there. I got to show them the photographs and their photo archives. Um, and over the years, more and more survivors would find my website. There was a woman in Israel, Varda Weisskopf, a survivor's daughter, who found another hundred in Israel, because many of them immigrated there after the war. So, I'm gonna say, I've probably talked to at least 50 or 100 of these survivors. The soldier liberators, medics, probably less than a dozen. Um, of course, they were older than mm -hmm. these children right. that they rescued. Um, but there's other people that are probably still out there, and there's going to be more elements of the story that are going to come to light as, as people become aware of the film and the, the train project. Um, and that's why I say it's never over. It's never over on a few levels. One is you can never stop educating, <laughs> because even when you think you're doing a great job, anti-Semitism is on the rise. I mean, we're not doing a good enough job. So that's the whole point of our project. There's more people out there who are probably on the train who, who might not even know. I mean, I get emails, I can't say on a regular basis anymore, but I do get these emotional emails from people who say, I was on that train, or my mother was on that train. She told us about it. One of the interesting stories is when we were just in Israel, <clears throat> a lot of some of the survivors remember a Jewish American GI whose name was Abraham Cohen, and he was running down the hill with his holding his Star of David, saying, "I'm a Jew. I'm here to save you." And he was crying. And he was crying. Wow. And, and a lot of the survivors talk about him. Yeah, and we found on one of the survivors' passports. This last trip, he signed her passport, a Abraham Cohen, and he wrote it, his name in Hebrew. Like he autographed it. Like he autographed it. Wow. You know, so you can imagine in the film, we're going to recreate that, you know, um, and that's a very dramatic scene. Um, the other interesting dramatic scene of the film is George Gross, who was the second tank commander. Red Walsh had to keep moving with the 30th, but mm -hmm. George was ordered to stay 24 hours and guard the train. The survivors, the testimony, um, they all lined up in a line, those who could. And they just simply wanted to shake George's hand and they wanted to introduce themselves because they felt human again. Yeah. And George, Matt has audio of George rec you know, recollecting that story. And you could, George was kind of a tough guy, you know, kind of a reserved you know, guy, but that impacted him greatly. Yeah, he cried in the interview. So It was a, it was a telephone interview because I never actually got to meet him. He lived in California and he couldn't fly anymore. And um, so I did a telephone interview in my classroom with 
20 kids, and he, uh, he just started to cry on the phone. But then, you know, you have to you have to let him cry. You have to let him express their emotion. And then he, um, he just indicated the beauty of the moment. He took one picture, and it's on the website, of this lovely Polish, twenty-something-year-old woman who became his interpreter because she spoke seven languages. She was teaching the young children in the Camp Bergen-Belsen some of the language skills. And um, her name was Gina Rappaport. And he has a beautiful picture of her in front of his tank that he took. He had her name, obviously. He lost touch with her because he wrote a beautiful narrative in 2002 for my website. And his last, his last um, words were, as I was pulling away that Saturday morning, you know, with the troops, because now help had arrived to transport these people to medical attention, etc. He said, I stopped my tank, I climbed out of the turret, and I ran back to Gina, who was standing there watching my tank leave, and I kissed her on the forehead. And I don't know why I did that, but it was my way of indicating that I'm sorry that this happened to you. Um, humanity, it's a symbol of humanity. And um, he got back in the tank and he left and he never heard from her again until, until the story went viral in 2007 after that first reunion. And we got an email from her son who was a doctor in Israel. And he, he sent me a photograph of Gina as an old woman sitting in the chair looking at that 1945 photograph in front of George Gross's tank. And Mike and I were lucky enough to interview her son. Gina passed away probably 10 years ago, um, never having actually physically met George Gross. But they had that moment. And Aaron told us more of the story. And um, he actually, his son had a video interview with George Gross, which we're going to use in the film, which we we're, we weren't even aware it existed. Like, at that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so it's uh, a beautiful story, and I it just keeps on going. I think the only other final story I'll say is when we were in Israel, the last remaining survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is still alive. She's no, she's 95. Let me rephrase that. The last remaining living survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, who is 95, we interviewed her. And she was on the train. And at the end of the interview, she said, you know, I'm old. And sometimes I feel guilty because I'm still alive. She goes, but they said, you need to go because you need to be the one to tell the story. So they pushed her out so that she would try and live. And she looked at me and she said, I'm not sure who's going to be left to tell the story. And I reached out and I grabbed her hand and I said, we will. We'll tell it. So that's what keeps us going. And she's a national hero in Israel because she was 14. The commander of the uprising said, no, you have to go. Somebody has to live to, to tell, tell the world. And the reason you have the Holocaust commemoration, usually late April, this time of the year, according to the Jewish calendar, it commemorates the Jewish resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943, which took place this time of the year. So this is why you have Holocaust Remembrance Day in Israel, Yom HaShoah, they call it. This is why you have the Days of Remembrance in Washington, D.C., the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and this is why we're going to be at the Ohio State House tomorrow the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising anniversary is when we take the time to remember the survivors of the ghetto and the fact that the last living survivor <laughs> was on this train is um, another, I guess you, I would say a miracle. It's just a miracle that this story just never seems to end and that's the way it should be. People need to remember. Thank you all so much.